Hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Rogers, and I am a social impact producer. We're so excited to be working on the documentary film As Prescribed, which many of you have seen as, as part of this screening already. Uh, and it lifts the veil on the invisible crisis of benzodiazepine overprescription and harm. And as you saw in the film, these widely marketed and prescribed medications have a darker side that have been overlooked for too long. And we're partnering on the screening uh, with the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, which is an amazing organization that works with providers to significantly reduce the number of benzodiazepine withdrawal sufferers by reducing the number of new prescriptions, limiting the duration of use, and providing evidence-based pathways for deprescribing. It's an amazing group. We're super excited to be partnering with them on this screening. Um, and if you're watching this panel, you probably have already seen the film. So you will know that it tells the story of benzodiazepine harm through the lens of people who have taken their medicines as prescribed by their medical providers. And it's why we're so excited about this conversation, uh, because we have both the patient and the provider point of view represented here. So it'll be a great discussion, and we're really excited to kick it off. Um, and I'm very excited on that note to introduce our panelists. First, we have Holly Hardman, who is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and is the director and producer of the film, as prescribed. She made this film because of her personal experience, having been prescribed a benzodiazepine and then going through a two-year taper period. She wanted to educate people about the adverse effects of benzos and advocate for better, better practices moving forward. Next, we have Geraldine Burns, who is the primary participant in the film, as you saw, and is a longtime advocate for the benzodiazepine community. She's led efforts to pass benzo legislation in Massachusetts, which you saw uh, depicted in the film, and has been a pioneer in the benzo community for over 20 years. Um, she also played a crucial role in publishing the Ashton Manual, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in this panel. Um, next, we have Dr. Alexis Ritvo, who is a board-certified addiction psychiatrist and assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She is also the medical director at the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices and co-chairs the Benzodiazepine Action Working Group with the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse. Last but not least, we have Dr. Christopher Blazes, who is an assistant professor of psychiatry and emergency medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. He is triple board certified in psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, and emergency medicine, and is on the board of directors for the Alliance. Thank you so much, each and every one of you, for being here today um, and being part of this panel. Very excited to dive into this conversation. So on that note, I will get started. I, I would love to first start with each of you, um, if you could just briefly start by sharing how you came to work in this space, and then we'll dive into the deeper conversation from there. So as a psychiatrist and addiction psychiatrist, um, get referred patients that have been prescribed benzodiazepines, and majority of them have been on them a, a long time, usually in the, you know, uh, years, um, sometimes decades, um, and are coming to us in psychiatry because uh, their symptoms are not well managed, whether that's often it's, you know, anxiety or insomnia, um, and trying to understand how we can better help them. Um, and so I think that's, that's how I initially got involved was just seeing a lot of these patients in general outpatient psychiatry. And then I think as an addiction psychiatrist, we are, you know, trained in evaluating and managing withdrawal from um, substances, including medications. And so patients that were struggling with benzodiazepines even taken as prescribed and having trouble um, stopping them, um, then would often get referred on to me to try, for me to try to work with them and figure out if we could find a way to minimize the harm um, these medications have done and try to make the, help them get on less medication or off completely in a, in a more tolerable, safer way. Chris, I'll go to you next. I've been, um, I was exposed to benzodiazepines first in my emergency medicine practice. And I was always, uh, it was, it was always curious because people would seem to be abnormally attached to the medications. And so the scientist in me was wondering why this was whenever I tried to have a conversation about whether or not this might be contributing to the reason that they ended up in the emergency department or a fall or something like that. And the idea of, you know, you know, considering stopping the benzodiazepine, people were very resistant to that. Um, and so I started to do a deep dive into the literature and learned that um, these are 
potentially dangerous medications um, and a lot of the dangers about the medications are not disclosed to patients before they're prescribed um, because quite honestly a lot of the prescribing um, physicians and other providers you know aren't even fully aware of the dangers of benzodiazepines so um, my interest started there and then i did my psychiatric training um, and then my addiction psych psychiatry training and i started to see many more of these patients on the other side of it who are trying to um, stop them and then i noticed how that became such a challenging process for many people. Um, and I realized that we don't know enough about it and I wanted to learn more and be a part of the process where we figured this out. Molly, I'll bump it to you next. I got involved because I found myself um, having, an, I was prescribed clonazepam, clonopin for chronic fatigue syndrome back in the 90s. And I did recover from that, and but I continued to have or developed symptoms that were never attributed to the clonazepam. I will add, I asked if clonopin was related to Valium because I didn't want to take something like Valium. I was told, oh, this is an improvement. All the problems that Valium had, um, you know, that's why clonazepam was developed. So you can take this for the rest of your life, you know. Um, so I thought, sure, this is a safe medication. And a number of years later, um, I realized that all these strange symptoms I had were due to the benzodiazepine. And it wasn't a doctor that informed me of that. It was by going to Wikipedia. And so that day I decided, I learned about the Ashton Manual, decided to taper and it took me about two years. And within that time, I said, my next film project is going to be about benzodiazepines. Great segue, Ashton Manuel, to you, Geraldine. So I was prescribed Ativan in 1988. I had a tough pregnancy, delivered very quickly and something didn't feel right. I had a heavy feeling. And because I kept saying in the hospital, I had a heavy feeling, I was prescribed Ativan. I did not want to take it. So that was in March. By August, I'm still not well. That heavy feeling is still there. And I'm told to go to a psychiatrist. And I went and right then and there, she told me to start taking Ativan and then she'd figure out what the uh, chemical imbalance was, which I said, I don't understand that. You know, can't you do a blood test? And she said, no, we'll just figure it out. So I will say the Ativan helped a little bit, you know, because I have another child, I'm not feeling well. And let's do a quick story here. A year later, we find out I had an infection. Once I took the antibiotic, I felt wonderful. Like I felt perfect again. So I stopped taking the Ativan. Little did I know you just can't stop taking it. And so I called my doctor. She said, you, I can't stop taking it. Tells me to go to hospital and I need to take it for the rest of my life. So, which scares me, you know, so you, you take it again, what's wrong with me. And, um, Long story short, I also noticed that my periods are changing over this time. So we now know that they knew one year after the drugs hit the market, the effect on a woman's menstrual cycle. So by the time I have a hysterectomy, when I wanted more children, six months later, I meet my new gynecologist and I tell her, I take this out of and I can't be without it. She turns and tells me I'm one of the most addictive medicines ever made, but doesn't know how to get me off, tells, gives me a thing to come off in two weeks. And there comes the research. And now I start the weaning. And I think four months coming off three milligrams after being on for 10 years is, oh, that I'm taking a long time. So little did I know how much I was going to be suffering. And when you go through something like that, you're thinking, how did every doctor I saw over the last 10 years not tell me when I asked every single one that it was the medication? I saw cardiologists. My heart was, I was having issues. I was having gastro issues. I was, I mean, I went from healthy to over the whole time I was taking uh, Ativan, getting sicker, sicker as my dose is going up and I'm in interdose withdrawal and tolerance, you know, it was just, and so when you find out that it's the drug, you have to say, I need to let other people know about this. And now I start to do the research. So then comes starting to reach out. The internet is now available and that's how it all snowballed. And then you start reaching out internationally across the ocean and we just start all combining and coming together. 
Amazing. It's such amazing work that you've been able to do. And I know that, you know, even just from hearing from so many people, how, how much you've changed their life and helping guide them through that, including Holly. Um, mm-hmm. um, so to start, Alexis, I'm going to start with you. I'd love to kind of start in a big picture and just ask the very basic question, what is BIND and how common is it? Because a lot of people don't actually know. Yeah. So BIND stands for benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. And it is a name that uh, a group um, of individuals, medical professionals, affected individuals, um, we went through a process of voting on uh, what term we thought would best represent the the protracted withdrawal or post-acute withdrawal um, and injury that some individuals that are prescribed benzodiazepines and have been taking them. um, And then also as they taper off or stop, um, experience. Um, so, you know, we don't, I think first and foremost is the fact we need a lot more research to, to better characterize buying, to better characterize, um, who's at greatest risk for being affected by it. Um, what the, the most common, um, symptoms are and, and how best to address them. Um, but what we do know from, um, from looking at both Heather Ashton's work and then from survey that we've looked at individuals affected by BIND is that it is, as as Geraldine and Holly described, it is a myriad of symptoms, psychological, physiological, I mean, for many people affecting almost every part of their um, body and experience. Um, And it seems to be a result of the body's adaptation or to taking these medications regularly, as well as likely some injury or, or um, neurotoxicity that the system experiences. We don't know the exact mechanism um, that ends up in impairing uh, your entire body, you know, likely through the, through the nervous system. And as a result of these symptoms, people become so unwell um, and, and negatively impacted that that it ends up affecting every part of their life. Um, so we know individuals in in the survey we did um, reported, you know, it, it caused people to lose jobs, houses, relationships. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people feeling so um, desperate and without support or help, and often not believed that they become suicidal. Um, and so it is just extremely life altering. Um, and we just don't yet have enough good information about exactly how it's caused and exactly how to um, help people with it besides trying to decrease how often we prescribe these meds and also support people doing slower patient-led tapers. Thanks for that. I think that's such a helpful orientation for people because I know it's still something that a lot of people are learning about. and I know, Chris, we talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to get a bit of the history um, and that historical context, because I know that's a big part of what informs how things are, are moving forward today. I think it's important in terms of understanding where we're at. You know, benzodiazepines were invented in Germany in the 1950s. Um, they were heavily marketed as a medication that's safer than the barbiturates to treat anxiety and the stressors of life. Um, and I think that um, this was happening right around the time, you know, the, the Mad Men era, where um, we were learning about the psyche and how it could be manipulated. Um, and, you know, the marketing was a major tool for that. And I believe that, that the Sacklers were involved with um, marketing Valium, which is one of the first benzodiazepines. Um, and as I'm sure most people in the audience know, that kind of led to um, their role in marketing the uh, opioids, which led to the, which contributed to the opioid crisis. Um, another dark aspect of this history is that a lot of the, the marketing was directed specifically towards women. And even if we look today, the uh, female to male ratio is still two to one in terms of who it's prescribed to. So I think we still have residual effects towards that and they marketed it um in you know many times you know misogynistic terms um you know uh back in the 1950s so 
I think this is a part of our past that we can't ignore um, and we need to understand moving forward. And also, oh, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to add that some of the research I've um, looked at more recently, that is more recent, does suggest that perhaps along with this marketing, this marketing history, this terrible marketing history, that the difference in endocrine systems be between men and women, uh, there's just possibly something about the nature of the women's of female endocrine system that makes them uh, more vulnerable to the harm. I read that recently. Oh, that's so interesting. It's a compounding negative when you have marketing efforts geared towards a particular population that also happens to be more vulnerable towards that particular thing. Um, it just goes to show that there's so much that is still being, you know, uncovered about all of this. Holly, moving into my next question for you, you made this film, you know, as a survivor, as someone with lived experience. And I, I'd love to hear from you in terms of what your goals were in making this from a messaging perspective, what you hope people take away from it. And as it relates to this conversation, particularly what you hope the medical community takes away from it. Well, I do want providers to understand and prescribers to understand what they are prescribing. I think that it's, I, I can uh, sort of sympathize with the difficulty in rummaging through all the research. Um, you know, I think doctors are asked to spend more time doing paperwork than they are to, to continue with any kind of meaningful research. I think that's, you know, we can look at the healthcare system too. Are our, our prescribers supported? Um, so that they can actually dig into newer research and understand this, um, the the sort of work that the alliance has been doing. Um, I want, of course, I want them to know what they're prescribing, and I want some change. And I love the idea of legislative change, and it's already happened in Colorado. And I'm really hoping we can make this happen now in Massachusetts, and then go beyond New York, California. And, and New Jersey has spoken about, somebody in New Jersey has said they might want to get on board, um, Connecticut. Yes, um, so I'm hoping that, so what I'm saying now, it's coming more from the grassroots population. Uh, but hey, wouldn't it be great if we didn't even need the legislation that informed consent and patient protections were truly being practiced? Geraldine, I'd love to hear from you on that. You've obviously led a lot of the efforts around legislation in Massachusetts. You've also helped countless people taper over the years and have been a huge resource for so many people. So I'd love to get your perspective on that. It actually would be good if we didn't have to do legislation. Um, we've gone in, I think, five times now we've gone in to testify. And I think it's, um, you know, I'll say this. When I first called over to England and they were like, well, wait a minute, you're from not only the United States, but you're in Boston. Like, so that was, I think the big shock with so many that I was from Boston. How did they not know in Boston about these drugs? So when it first, when I first found out that it was the drugs making me sick and I was taken out of the workforce, I mean, I loved my job. I worked in human resources. So I think the human resource part of me was, you know, we have to do something about this, but you know, here in Boston, I, when I've called Mass General, Brigham and Women's, you know, I've called all the big hospitals, called a lot of addiction doctors. They didn't want to hear from me. They did not want to hear from me. It was, I don't know why, uh, although at the time, and I know they kind of denied this, uh, Holly will back me up on this the first time we had the hearing that they all said they never heard of this, but Mass General back in 1990, so I came off in 97. So let's say by 1998 as I'm suffering, you know, I'm off the drugs and suffering, they're actually running a benzodiazepine discontinuance clinic. They actually have one, but they would only take you if you were on Xanax and Clonopin. And I was on, I had come off Ativan. So after I, like all the phone calls that I'm making, they're like, well, we would have taken you. I'm like, but I was like, what did you offer? Was there a way of tapering? Did you talk about diet? Did you talk about this? And they said, no, um, they just kind of made people taper. So 
you know, as far as the legislative effort, we are in Massachusetts. We're old school politics, so it's very hard. I know we all had hopes of it passing quickly, but it takes time. The, the governor's own opioid bill took years of him filing over and over again. So I'm not upset at the process, but more people are harmed each year. As we go back in, there are more suicides. In fact, watching the film, uh, again, each time we watch the film, when you hear that first phone call of a suicide and the end of more suicides, my son actually just said to me this morning, the most upsetting part was seeing the names of the suicides. And I'm like, and since the film, there's been even more. So it, you'd think after all these years, it would have caught on. But instead, there's still denial out there that there's no such a thing. So I, I don't know. So that's why we have to keep going the legislative um, route. And, and uh, you know, the reason I, I went this way was because it was a pharmacist that asked me years ago to sue. And it's the pharmacist asking, look at, unless there are lawsuits, the doctors won't pay attention. I mean, who wants to go through that process? But that's the process. I've done everything I was asked to do to make a change or that I wanted to do. You know, I was asked by a pharmacist to start with a lawsuit us to start, okay, let's go legislatively. I mean, look how long it's taking. That's the sad part. How many more have been put on as we've all been trying to work hard and bring information? No, absolutely. And I think that going to you, Alexis and Chris, I'd love to to hear from you because I know, you know, you're you're speaking to the obviously the the role of legislation in moving this this change forward because it raises the profile and it makes people aware. Um, and I know a lot of doctors and a lot of prescribers are are not aware of the depths of these issues. Um, so Alexis, Chris, what has been your experience on that side of things? Where do people go to get help, to get information? And what do you think are the biggest things or what are the most important pieces in terms of making doctors and providers more aware of this? I think it takes a uh, multi-pronged approach. Um, I think, you know, you need you need the education that although depending on where it's given i mean tends to also be a self selecting group that seeks out learning more about these um things but for instance chris and i are are presenting soon at the addiction psychiatry conference which is um a group that's previously been um open to learning more about this um so i think you i mean you start there um and and then you also try to see what other efforts can be made, whether that's legislation to, so in Colorado, the legislation restricts the duration of an initial prescription um, in for patients that haven't been prescribed in the last month. Um, so making sure that providers know about that limitation and why it exists and how it relates to the FDA black box warning from 2020, which I think a lot of prescribers don't actually know or understand what, why, uh, or what the significance of that black box warning was. Um, I think continuing to just tell our patients' stories about patients we have seen that have been harmed as well as who have, you know, gotten better over time. Um, and um, and then I think seeking, you know, continuing to seek the, the data and the research and funding to do research to, um, to really validate the existence of of all the suffering and how we can approach it um because it's there um there's no question about it um uh but a lot of you know there's there's the skeptics or the people that will say well until you have a higher quality study you know you can't say that it's it's um it's not caused by other things and so i think we need to just continue to try to seek ways to even better um characterize it and and get people the, the support and care they deserve. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's really challenging because a lot of the, you know, physicians and prescribers and providers have a sense of almost learned helplessness, right? We, we, we really crave definitive answers and scales and measures and, you know, um, sources that we can go to to tell us what to do. But this is such a complex issue that presents in so many different ways in, in each person that there's no resource that we can go to to kind of tell us this is what we need to do. So a lot of people who, when they present to even an experienced psychiatrist or internal medicine doc, um, honestly, it's very hard to know what to do. 
So I think we're 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 learning more about it. But as as Alexis alluded to, we really need to um, have more resources uh, directed towards understanding this at a deeper level, so that we could provide definitive answers. Until then, we're relying on our clinical experience. Um, from being people who have been interested in this um, intensely over time and have become, in, in a way, um, de facto centers of excellence where people kind of reach out to us for advice and we kind of present at different conferences nationally. So things are going in the right direction, um, but we're still pretty far away from um, having definitive answers and guidance and guidelines. On that note, you know, in terms of relying on the clinical experience and then for Holly and Geraldine from a lived experience point of view, how do people know if they've been harmed by benzodiazepines? What do patients need to look out for? What do providers need to look out for as they're navigating this? I could start. It's, um, again, and this is part of the problem is that it's different in every person. You know, when Benzodiazepines in many and maybe even most people might not cause these problematic enduring problems. In general, if I had to characterize it, I would say that the nervous system is dialed up too high and it's on edge and any sensation or any emotion is exaggerated. And so if someone perhaps had a propensity towards loud noises being problematic um, prior to being on benzodiazepines. If they were on benzodiazepines, then that would be exaggerated and worse and more problematic. Um, so we're trying to characterize and to predict who will, you know, develop this kind of enduring um, process that we're calling BIND. And, and at this point, we can't predict who it's going to happen to, and we can't predict how it's going to manifest. So one thing that I've noticed over time is that sometimes symptoms um, that were present before to a much lesser degree can become exaggerated, uh, but this is by no means a rule. Unfortunately, we don't know. Things I hear over and over again and it is that, the, for example, the anxiety goes to another level. Panic attacks um, are not like a short panic attack. They become rolling panic attacks and just these extremes is and you want to say well are you getting better <laughs> um and sometimes that can be a tip off that it's not working well and something else has been developing in the central nervous system that's it has mean harm yeah i wanted to say one thing so i think over the years we see two kinds of patients there are the patients that like myself that when I start taking it, um, I'm developing anxiety, I'm developing panic attacks, and I develop agoraphobia. I don't even know what agoraphobia is till somebody tells me why I can't leave the house. And I'm also on a short acting benzo, and I'm reaching tolerance and I have to go higher, so I'm having the interdose withdrawal. Then there's the other patient, they stay at the same dose for years, they don't have any problems. They actually don't even develop any problems until one day their doctor decides to cut them off. And now they can't function. They go right into hell, directly to hell, you know. And then uh, then there are those that can just, that are cut off and they don't have a problem. They don't even, you know, lose five minutes of their life. So there are the, the two, two sides of it. Those that are having problems for years on them, getting sicker, 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 like myself, chasing the mysterious illness. And those that have no clue of what's to come or even if it will come. So you hope that they're the lucky ones that can get off and won't have a problem. So how do you even tell by those patients until somebody someday tries to take them off? And we've had people that all of a sudden a doctor wants to start taking them off. And they're like, why? My life is fine. You know, I don't want to come off. I've actually seen on these groups how sick people get. And they beg their doctors to let them stay on. So it's, it's um, and that's part of what our bill is here. We don't want, I'm not against the drugs. People are shocked when I say that. There, I agree with, with Dr. Blazes. It's There is a purpose for these drugs. So people are shocked when I say it after the harm that I got, but no, there is a purpose. And, but we, the other side is we wanna protect people on them that they're not cut off because that's who's now coming into the groups. I don't know what's happened, what's changed that they're all being, there are uh, a lot of, I think it's the clinics when you walk in, there's a sign saying we no longer prescribe benzodiazepines and they list the names of them. 
this is this is the new people coming into the groups. They're all just being cut off. Now, I just want to comment on that real quick. Exactly what Geraldine is describing is I wrote a paper and um, titled Complex Persistent Benzodiazepine Dependence, which describes exactly what you're talking about, where patients have been stable for a long period of time, and during forced deprescribing, symptoms emerge that, are, that can be very debilitating. And it's kind of like a severe form of bind. So thank you for bringing awareness to that. And I think it speaks to what you were, we were talking about before, which is, you know, and I'd love for you to speak to it again, um, which is, they're not always bad. And those two differences are are very important because it's there's so much nuance and and it speaks to Alexis what you were talking about in terms of the um the Colorado legislation that you know had limits in terms of duration. Um but I'd love to hear a little bit about that piece too, because I think that's an important part of the conversation. Yeah, well, in, in emergency medicine, benzodiazepines are necessary and we use them every single day for acute agitation and acute severe anxiety. Also in the inpatient psychiatric setting, they are a necessary part of our practice and they're very useful. Um, where we run into problems is when they're prescribed on a daily basis consistently, where there's kind of less evidence for their efficacy um, that, and that's what can progress to bind or complex persistent benzodiazepine dependence. And I would just like to add to that, that part of the, I hear horror stories consistently about um, emergency room um, prescribing because too often they're not seeing the history. They're, often people go in when they're already dealing with bind, they have no idea, they've never heard, um, they've never heard of bind before. Um, they they don't even know that they're taking something that might be called a benzodiazepine. And, and you hear this a lot, that then they're given a benzodiazepine um, in the emergency room for usually a terrible anxiety attack or something and walk off with a prescription and um, then discover that they're in a wor much worse state. And so this is how confusing it all is because as much as they are life-saving on a regular basis every day. Also, you hear from people often that it's the emergency room that put them into full force, full on um, unrelenting bind. Chris, Alexis, I'd love to hear your perspective on that if that's something that you've seen. Um, and similarly, I know a question that you guys get often and that Holly and Geraldine do as well is, do addiction treatment facilities work for this? What do people do if they want to engage in tapering? What do people need to know to advocate for themselves in hospital settings and emergency room settings and otherwise? Um, and what and just generally, what are the options in terms of treatment and recovery that people need to be aware of? I think it's it's difficult. I mean, as as Holly was describing, when someone that has been prescribed or as recently tapered or discontinued a benzodiazepine presents in the emergency room for reasons that are related to either, you know, um, uh, ongoing withdrawal or a reason that might be associated with a benzodiazepine. I think it is tricky because they often, I mean, sometimes they might have medical records that are connected to their other care, um, but often they don't, depending which system they're, they're showing up in. And then as Holly alludes to, I mean, a, a, a good portion of the patients prescribed these medications have no idea that this is even a potential risk. I mean, many of them don't even know that if they stop the medication acutely, um, it comes with a, a risky and potentially life-threatening acute withdrawal. Um, so that's, it is a tricky space. I think what Chris was, you know, talking about is, of course, like uh, from a severe agitation um, uh that, that there are a, there are certain cir circumstances in the ED where these are both life saving and and absolutely um, necessary for both patient safety and and other providers, but it can be hard to um, you know tease apart um, for for other patients that have been on these meds if their presentation is actually related to the the medication or something else. Um, as far as where these patients should go, I mean, I think when it's a benzodiazepine that has been taken as prescribed, then 
ideally it will be managed on an outpatient basis by a prescriber that either knows something about this or if they don't is open to learning about it and is open to trying to take a more gradual patient-led approach to to decreasing these medications and work with the patients. And I think, you know, I've, I've come to, I think I used to, in my tra- initial training felt like, oh, we should try to get as many people completely off benzodiazepines as we can, because they have a lot of long-term risks to get into the point of, you know, taper them if the patient is motivated and wants to, to now a lot of times trying to work with patients to say, let's see, like, let's see if you're motivated to do this. Let's see what the lowest amount we can get you on. And it may be completely off and it may not be, we might reach a point where we decide the risks of trying to get you completely off are greater than the benefits. Um, So I think that's the ideal, but I think we need to educate a lot more providers and support them in taking that approach rather than this kind of all and nothing of, I don't prescribe these at all. And I won't continue someone that's been on these long-term to, you know, I won't try to have a conversation with a patient about whether or not we should try to decrease this medication. Um, so I think it's tricky. And, and then some patients end up in being referred to addiction treatment centers when they're not um, dealing with an addiction um, and got, go through a very rapid withdrawal and that really increase the risks. Um, you know, I think there there is a small percentage of folks where they have developed a use disorder and then you end up in a tricky space trying to decide whether you're going to manage them outpatient or have to do inpatient, but that's a very, very small percentage and is not the vast majority. And yet the vast majority end up being kind of um, often forced into the addiction treatment realm. Yeah, I've, I've noticed the practice of emergency medicine has really profoundly changed over the past 25 years since I've been doing it. Um, long time ago we had much more resources available to us we were able to appropriately triage people to the appropriate outpatient follow-up less people would go to the er because they had better care prior to that but now it's turned into this kind of uneven remainder situation where everyone just goes to the er because they're not being seen in other situations and so the er's are kind of overwhelmed and you know, we're left with just kind of putting a Band-Aid on something and patching it up um, because there's 30 other people waiting behind. It's very unfortunate, um, and our medical system is not nearly as healthy as perhaps many people think it is, and I think that's a contributing factor to this. Um, and I think that's also a contributing factor to why this is so hard. It, I mean, if I would, if this, if this happened to, you know, uh, a billionaire's family member, we would know what to do. We can send them to a private pay drug and alcohol rehab center where they could be monitored very closely by somebody and make medication adjustments on a daily basis and um, and watch things appropriately and guide them through the process. But for you know 99.8% of the population, there's not a great place to go for this, right? In, in, in many circumstances, I would actually recommend stabilization in an inpatient setting or a residential setting to really get a hold of going on and to give people some momentum upon which they could build and move forward. So um, so it's really hard as a patient to navigate that because you don't, you don't know what you're going to get with any of these uh, specific situations. So I think finding a, an advocate, it could be a primary doc, it could be a psychiatrist who understands this deeply, who can vet some of the other services and you know, the places that you might um, think of going is, is, is the best possible way to go. And so that's how some of these, um, you know, uh, some of these outpatient services and groups like the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices can be helpful in directing you to um, a resource that can um, provide some guidance. Hi. Um, I do know of people who have had limitless resources and have done, try to do an inpatient approach. And of course, what's going to work for so well for one person isn't for another. And again, you hear the horror story that it was because this can take years. I mean, it took me two years. Um, And I I just worry about giving people the impression that if they have enough money (laughs) that they can pay to go to a safe space, uh, um, there's a place in Los Angeles called Oro House. 
I was speaking with them recently. They do, they use the, the precepts of the Ashton manual actually. And I don't wanna leave this without speaking of how many, I, I think at this point it probably is millions who have been, and thank you Geraldine for connecting with Professor Ashton that the Ashton manual has, is still helping people and it's been helping people for decades. Um, with, with, without following it literally, but understanding, as she said, it's not like a lawnmower manual, but just the the um, the principles of the Ashton manual, which is ultimately patient guided, symptom based. And I'm also excited that um, it, Mark Horowitz has been working on in the UK on a new um, a deprescribing section for the Maudley. I just said Maudley or Maudsley, Maudsley guidelines. And that will be published in the spring. And um, it, so like, this is av available to doctors. I want more prescribers to respect what the Ashton Manual is and really learn how to use it without, because my doctor suggested following it literally. And that was the one time during my taper where I just, or there were two times, the first time where I just said, I'm not going to make it. And I didn't sleep for like three weeks because she was cutting me too quickly. And so then I stepped away. So was I following the Ashton manual? Um, that's where even the Ashton manual, you have to be careful. This is, and then, but I do have a feeling, I have a sense that the new Maudsley deprescribing guidelines for benzodiazepines and antidepressants are going to address um the more complex nature of um, the de-prescribing for benzodiazepines and proper protocols. Geraldine, on that note, speaking of the Ashton Manual, I'd love to pass it over to you. You've played such a critical role in the development and distribution of the Ashton Manual and still do. And I'd love to hear from you what you hear from people, what you hear from patients, and how people can access it if they're interested in learning more. Um, there is a website that we have called benzobookreview.com where people get a softbound copy. And when you order that, you also get an immediate download of it. Um, there's also a different version over at uh, benzoinfo.com. The version when you do the paid version, um, because some people, if you print anything from the internet, you bring it into the doctors. What we hear is they won't look at it. They're like, oh, you're paying attention to the internet. So getting the softbound book, I think is important. And that version we send money over to Professor Ashton's um, son, John. We still, I sent it over to Professor Ashton when she was alive and she would further the benzo cause. So just so people understand the difference. And um, I mean, you know, people, some people say, I wish I found it sooner. I mean, it's been out there now for years we've had it. And, you know, I thought, okay, once we have that, we have the validation, this is going to make a change. And I can see where it's, you know, who's ordering it. And it's nice when we can see rehabs or doctors ordering it, which is wonderful. Um, you know, mostly it's it's people that are sick. You know, some will write me a note. And it's literally almost every country. It is amazing how many countries. It's now, I believe, in 14 languages. So when you think when I called Professor Ashton that day to ask her to contribute to a book that I was doing, I wanted this international book and I was getting information from different doctors in different countries. And, and when oh, she sent over the three chapters, I was floored. I mean, she was such a kind, giving woman of her time. And back in the day before she got sick, the people sent her a letter. She actually wrote them back. And, and what we need more is, um, I'm hoping the next step that we see here in this country is that there are phone lines where people can call and we're not charging people for it because that's what the UK had. In fact, a lot of the Americans were calling over to the UK for their helplines getting help. They're also sick and not working. And we need to have something established here in this country. There was one of the doctors that wanted to do that at one point. He wanted to set up, um, similar to what Tranks had in Australia and New Zealand, he wanted to set that up here in North America. I was too sick at the time to get involved, but I hope that's our next thing we can do. But, um, you know, as we were doing the information, getting it from around the world, you know, to do this book, which I, I still have the information somewhere here in this house. I had said to my son, Garrett, and we do a lot of work together on the whole benzodiazepine uh, thing is my last thing I want to do is finish that book. I've decided by the time I turn 70, 
in a little over a year, I'm like, that's going to be the last thing that we do when we finish, you know, we'll keep doing the podcast, but yeah, it's helped a lot of people. It's amazing how many people that you knew them at their sickest and to see them when they're back fully alive again, that is a tremendous thing to, for me to witness all these years. I'm sure Holly, people that she, when you're talking to these people, you don't think they're going to make it. They don't think they're going to make it. And, and it's truly amazing to see the, um, the change when they're get some of them get married, they have more children, they're back to work, they've started companies. But one of the things I wanted to say, if, if somebody was about to start coming off of benzodiazepine, I am a firm believer, because myself, I was on them for all those years, my body was not healthy. I believe in just like a marathon, getting ready, get your support ready, get your diet in line. I do believe these drugs affect our, our digestion terribly. And we're not absorbing because if you look, a lot of us look very sick. You're very thin. Um, so I do believe in getting healthy. I've been helping this woman who's the same age as me, 68. She's on five drugs. She too sick to cook. She's ordering in foods for like Whole30. She's swimming. She took uh, one drug that a doctor had just added in a fifth drug to her. She stopped that. She is doing fantastic. So if it's 68, she can do it by lining everything up first, you know, and I think support is wonderful. And I know I was like a unicorn with all the support I got back in the day before there was all this knowledge. It is so important because the ones whose family just think they're crazy. It's awful, especially when their doctor is also saying, look at these drugs aren't causing a problem. They're mentally ill. You know, there's a lot of wonderful people behind that veil of being drugged. No, thank you for sharing that. That's so powerful. And I think that support system piece is huge for recovery from anything. Um, and such an important, such an important part of the conversation that can't be ignored. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time. And I want to, I want to go to Alexis and Chris, you are obviously medical providers. You're deep in that community. You're working with Alliance uh, for Benzodiazepine Best Practices because you are advocating for this and want people to know about it. What are, what are the, for anybody watching, for medical providers watching, what are some of the kind of first steps that they can take if they want to be deeper, you know, more deeply engaged in this issue to advocate for their patients and to help the medical community become more aware of what's happening? I think first and foremost, to me, educating uh, yourself about what is out there. So with reputable sources like the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices um, and the Ashton Manual, um, talking to patients, looking, I mean, looking at the resources um, and listening to some accounts of, of individuals like Holly Geraldine um, and, and many of our other um folks that we work with who have been so harmed by these medications um, to understand it and, and decide, you know, how you can um, support and advocate for them. So I think that's first and foremost, and then looking, you know, for, for those resources um, to use to both help your patients and, and educate your colleagues. Yeah. And I think it's, it's uh it's a challenging situation, and, and but I think the key is to find a champion, someone who has a deep interest in this and who knows about this, who can connect to other people in the community who have uh, a more in-depth knowledge of this is the best way to go. Because what I was alluding to before, and, and thank you, Holly, for kind of uh, correcting what I said, is even unlimited resources is not a guarantee that you can um, you know, navigate these waters in a beneficial way. But knowing what's out there and knowing the specifics about where you're going to go and what um, what to expect when you get there, I think uh, is really important. I think that you know Alexis and I have been giving lectures throughout the country um, for years now. Um, accessing some of of these archived lectures can be a helpful place to start because it reviews a lot of the basics of this, um, and they're available on the internet if you you know type in OHSU psychiatry grand rounds um, you can access some archive lectures i think that could be a good place to start um, and then reaching out to those of us who are interested in this and for anyone watching we're going to make sure that you have access to those resources we'll put up an end card at the end of this panel uh, with that information so you'll be able to have that 
Holly, Geraldine, I'd love to pass it over to you. Holly, you made this film uh, from a patient perspective. Geraldine, you're obviously one of the primary film subjects. What impact do you hope this film has, not only on the general public, but on the medical community in particular? Validation um, all around that uh, that that we I, we put the um, at the end of the film. I, I sort of redid it to include to really spell out benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. I think that's such a key element of the story that it, it helps people understand. Like when I was in the earlier phases of making the film and I would talk about um, the benzodiazepine dependency, or, you know, trying to find ways to say, well, it's not addiction. You know, I've experienced, I know the difference. And it really wasn't until I started thinking this is this is certainly neurotoxicity certainly that but it just it also it seemed to be one of those things was almost like kismet we were all kind of thinking at the same time um injury injury benzodiazepine injury and then benzodiazepine induced and i know when i first spoke with alexis i actually said i was calling it benzodiazepine induced um, neurological and physiological dysfunction, but Alexis set me straight. We didn't need that physiological in there. It covers it all. Um, I'd like that to be as well known. I would like as as multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's. I want people, I want the public to know what BIND is, know it's a real thing, and then we can maybe prevent further harm and really give people the help they need and start to use benzodiazepines properly, finally. Aside from validation, which obviously the documentary does that for me, when we're sick and we want our loved ones to understand so they can help understand us, they'll sit down and they'll watch a movie. So here's the documentary. You could sit down with your loved ones and go, look, this is real. So it's so important. This film is so important because others can watch it and see others suffering. I think when you look at my friend Paula, you know, you see her at one point, you know, and, you'll, and then you see her come to life again and she's not even fully off, but I also found a wonderful doctor who's letting her micro taper going at her own pace. So again, even if you can get your doctor to watch them, you know, you don't, and I, I think people think, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, but um, benzodiazepine people can be kind of hard to handle because we can be very, very sick and very needy. And in my case where I became agoraphobic, monophobic, I had to have a babysitter with me constantly, but I have a big family. So somebody had to be with me. I'm the most independent person you'd ever want to meet, but a drug caused that in me. So we can be a lot to handle. And um, so this kind of helps explain it all, I think, in a lot of ways. You see Scotty get sick. You see the effect it had on his marriage. It shows you that this is real. And um, it's probably the best tool that we have to, to show our family and loved ones and, and the medical community. I couldn't have said it better myself. Absolutely. Um, it's such an amazing tool for validation and building that empathy and really being able to share and showcase what that experience is like for people who might not know whether they're friends, whether they're loved ones, whether they're people who just want to learn more. Um, it's such an important resource and the film will be available to the wider public um, soon, very soon. Um, and you can find out more information at asprescribedfilm.com. Um, you'll see information there about the film, about release, about our impact campaign and what we're doing um, to engage in this work. So you can find more information there. To find more information about the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, you can visit benzoreform.org and you can learn more about their work there. They have amazing resources and stuff that they're doing. So you can find out ways to be involved there. And I just want to take a minute to, as we wrap, to say thank you to our panelists. Um, it's been such an amazing conversation. I've learned a tremendous amount. And I know people watching well as well. And I think this is such an important piece of coming together where we have the voices of patients and lived experience represented and the voices of providers, because uh, it's only in that you know exchange that I think change will really move forward. So thank you so much and really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the film. <laughs>